Today we're going to look at a topic in science called photosynthesis. You will come across this topic in year 7, in year 9, at key stage 4 at GCSE level, at A level if you were to do A level biology and you would come across it at degree level. A little bit like a spiral, you would cover it at different levels at different complexities. Today I want to talk just a little bit about what happens in photosynthesis and the factors that affect photosynthesis. Now photosynthesis takes place in plants. It's what every plant does to produce its own energy. If we need fuel, we go down the shops and we buy crisps, Mars bars, sweeties, oranges, apples, pears, and we eat them when we get our fuel. The plant can't do that. It has to make its own fuel. It needs sunlight, it needs water, and it needs carbon dioxide. Without those three things, the plant is going to die. And it needs them in the right amounts. Too much is a waste of time, too little, and photosynthesis is not going to take place. So stuff has to go into the plant and some stuff comes out. Quite usefully, the stuff that comes out, one is very useful for the plant, the glucose that it produces, and it produces that for its energy. But the other thing which is hugely useful for us is oxygen. Sammy, can you tell me why do you think that the waste product from photosynthesis from plants, oxygen, the waste product, why is that any use to us? Richard? Because we need it to breathe. Absolutely, we need it to breathe. So every time we chop down trees, we pull up plants, we cut out hedgerows in the countryside, we are stopping vital production of oxygen. And that is no good. If I could reproduce what goes on in the leaves in something called the chloroplasts, which contain chlorophyll in leaves, the green substance in leaves, if I could reproduce that, and be able to produce as much energy as plants use, I wouldn't be here presenting this because I'd be on a yacht in the Mediterranean. I would be a multimillionaire. It is a fantastic process. We know it goes on, but we don't quite know how these chloroplasts, these little factories, how they convert carbon dioxide and water and light into energy. It is really very, very clever. But as I said earlier, a little bit of these things is not enough too much of them it doesn't make any difference we're gonna have a little look about how people might carry out investigations to measure just how much of light carbon dioxide and um, water is needed to affect photosynthesis we often use and some of you may have ponds at home we often use a pond weed it's got a special name called Elodea and we use it uh, because we can actually see, if you stand there and watch pondweed, you can see little tiny bubbles being produced by the leaves. These are the waste product, if you remember and you were listening carefully, the waste product that we need from photosynthesis, shown by bubbles on pondweed leaves is... Lewis? Oxygen. Oxygen, well done, good man, okay, alright. And there's a the sort of experiment that we have. A bowl of water, an upturned funnel, a test tube, and a lamp. I suppose, Katie, there's probably a good reason to have a lamp. Do you think it's to keep the plant warm? Because we know that warmth may affect photosynthesis. Or is it more important that that plant has got light going on it? Um, so the plant has light going on it? Absolutely. So the plant's got light going on it. So if I had this in a darkened room and I only had a light bulb shining on it, think about this, Chris. If I switched the light bulb off, do you think photosynthesis would take place? Yes or no? No. And of course that's the right idea. So realistically, Nicole, is photosynthesis going to take place at night time? No. Not at all. You're dead right. Well done. Good girl. So there we have. We can see the little bubbles going up there, which is showing that a gas is produced. You have to believe me that it's oxygen gas. Next time we meet, we're going to test for that gas to see, a special test to see if it is oxygen gas. Okay. Three things that we want to consider about factors that affect photosynthesis. Temperature, the amount of light, and the amount of carbon dioxide. And plants need those three, three things. Too little, and there's not enough photosynthesis taking place. What might happen, do you think, Sammy, to a plant 
if it's deprived of these things for photosynthesis to take place, if there's not enough light, water, carbon dioxide, what might happen to the plant? Might die. It could die, or it could grow very, very slowly, couldn't it? And if it was a plant that was used for, for food stuff, and we wanted to, it was a crop, and we wanted to grow very quickly, and it was deprived of some of this stuff, it's not going to produce as much food, is it, for us? Okay, the first one. Now, this graph, it's quite a useful graph. If you're very good at understanding graphs, we can see where we start at zero degrees. Temperature on the, y, uh, on the x axis along the bottom there is increasing from z left to right, and we can see exactly what happens as the temperature increases initially Abby what's happening to the rate of photosynthesis by that graph as temperature increases it goes up but then it that's, goes that's, down hang on that's all I want for the moment it goes up until a certain point what's the point that something change happens Abby go on when it gets too hot when it gets too hot now a little bit like us, we don't like extreme heat and plants are no different. They like it warm, too warm and it's no good. And we can see on that graph at 45 degrees photosynthesis begins to stop and it stops very rapidly. It stopped rapidly because the plant is dying. That's the measure of it. The next one we want to consider is the amount of carbon dioxide on a plant. Well, the amount of carbon dioxide will not kill a plant, but certainly a little will slow up photosynthesis, whereas the right amount will cause photosynthesis to increase and become more efficient. And once you see, as the concentration reaches a maximum, of course, no more photosynthesis takes place. There was an old gentleman I knew years ago in a greenhouse. He used to have a little paraffin heater. Any idea why he might have had a paraffin heater? A little paraffin heater in a greenhouse. You think in a greenhouse you've got all the light coming in. He might have watered the plants. James? It produced carbon dioxide. Absolutely. It enriched the carbon dioxide atmosphere. You couldn't give them too much because not likely, if you remember, the one where we had too much temperature kills them off. Too much carbon dioxide, all it does is it becomes level. No more photosynthesis. Doesn't kill them off. So that was a very, you know, that was an old, an old chap, an old gardener I knew many, many years ago. The last one, similar, the light intensity. And of course, you know, we grow plants in greenhouses because it allows lots of light in. It allows lots of um, heat to be retained. But the third thing, it doesn't allow. What doesn't a greenhouse allow? Can someone think about what, Nicole, what doesn't a greenhouse allow that you might have to do to plants? Katie, the rain. it's stopping the rain, so you have to water inside a greenhouse. So greenhouses are awfully efficient at keeping temperature right for photosynthesis and for growth. They're awfully good at keeping the, the light intensity high but they're not very much good at keeping the water in there. So you have to add that. So three things we've considered that affect the, um, the amount of light, the amount of carbon dioxide, and the amount of water to take place. Uh, and for photosynthesis to take place in the chloroplast in the leaves. And also, we know now that glucose and what we need, oxygen, is produced as a byproduct or waste product. When we meet next, we're going to look at how we can collect the gas and how we can test for the gas that, that's produced from photosynthesis to see if it really is oxygen. Thank you for listening so patiently this afternoon. See you again soon.